I'm Dr. Daniel Cantor, Neurology in Real Time, and I'm excited to be joined here today by Dr. Mark Friedman, who is Professor of Medicine in the field of Neurology at the University of Ottawa and the Director of the Multiple Sclerosis Research Unit at Ottawa Hospital General Campus and a Senior Scientist in the Neuroscience Program at Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. Dr. Friedman, thank you so much for joining us yet again. What we're gonna talk about today is about stem cells. We've heard a lot about stem cells over the last several years, and a lot of it has been, frankly, from you and the research that you're doing. Recently, there were results of a trial that you weren't involved with, as far as I know, and this had to do with something called mesenchymal stem cells. First, for the people back home, when somebody comes into your office and they ask you what a stem cell is, what do you tell them? That's a loaded question because stem cells are a lot of things, but what they are referring to are, are the cells that are going to magically and hopefully transform their disease and be the cure-all, which they are not. Okay. Uh, typically, a stem cell is a very primordial cell, a cell that has uh, either been forced backwards on its development so that it is not really committed to be any particular kind of cell of the body uh, or uh, is brand new and has, hasn't yet committed down a path. So when you think of, of, of all the cells that are developing in a young embryo, there's a stage where they all look the same. There's just a big ball of cells. And then somehow, magically, some go this way and become a brain, and this way and become a heart, and this way become a kidney. Mm -hmm. It's all genetically driven as the cells differentiate. Okay. And once they've been committed down a path, now we know you can send them backwards, but that is really a technology that is yet to hit humans. It's called induced pluripotential stem cells. We're doing it in animals. We are yet to uh, uh, getting these types of trials into humans because the way you send them back is using some factors that include something called an oncogene, which unfortunately uh, is a gene that drives potential for cancer. So they haven't been approved yet by regulatory to use in humans. But what we can do is derive cells from different body cavities and in those cavities, we find cells that have yet to differentiate. And that's what's been called you know, a primordial stem cell. You can get neural stem cells, you can get stem cells from any part of the body. But mesenchymal stem cells, uh, they've been differentiated a little bit, but they still retain their pluripotential nature, meaning they can be committed down any path. But that's not why people are grabbing onto MSCs. They're grabbing onto them because they have a number of other properties that can turn down immune responses. And I was uh, the co-director of an international mesenchymal stem cell transplant study, which is trying at this point to get the manuscript uh, published. We, it's been submitted, the studies uh, was completed and we presented the preliminary results actually at the last spectrums where we were able to get together by my colleague, uh, Antonio Uccelli. The one that you're talking about was a different source of cells, and uh, that was uh, yet another interesting study, uh, but of course uh, used a different uh, type of, of paradigm than we did. We injected all of our uh, patients intravenously, and some groups feel that that is not good enough. You have to put the cells directly into the central nervous system to make a difference. So mesenchymal stem cells, you can get them from the blood, you can get them from the from the marrow, you can get them from fat, you can get them from your from your teeth if you wanted to. They're, they're in every part of the body. You give them, are they actually going and replacing the nerves? Are they replacing the covering of the nerves or are they adding nutrients to the nerves? So, so there's three different ways in which mesenchymal stem cells potentially could help. Um, the one way that it's least likely to help is what you've just suggested that these cells will go to the heart or to the brain and now be committed and become a new heart cell or a brain cell and replace damaged tissue or replace the oligodendrocyte in, in multiple sclerosis and now rewrap 
the, the, the axons. It's, it's been shown that it can, they can do this in animals, but there's very, very little evidence that they do so in humans. Mm -hmm. Probably what they are doing is, and, and this is part of their unique nature, what attracts them to areas of damage isn't clear, but when they get there, they have the potential to release upon visiting this tissue a number of pro-growth factors that can either, in the case of MS, help to promote the oligodendrocytes, the cells that make the myelin, to proliferate, expand, do what they have to do, uh, because they're there anyways. It's not like we need them, but they're there and they're just not doing their job. And, and it may well be that the MSCs now stimulate them to, hey, come on guys, get up and repair this damaged wire. And that's what we see in animals, but we've yet to prove that they do that in humans. Now, in the study that you were co-directing, was it the stem cells were helping? Were they also getting chemotherapies? One of the things that Dr. Cohen was talking to us about was when we looked earlier, not at mesenchymal stem cells, but at hematopoietic stem cell research, a lot of the benefit he thinks was not from the stem cells, but was from the chemotherapies. And, and that's true. I mean, these studies that replace the immune system mm -hmm. are simply using the stem cells to regrow a new immune system along with a new hematopoietic system because you're removing it with your chemotherapy in the hopes that you've removed the problem that was driving MS. So that technically is bone marrow transplantation, okay. although some of the programs are immunoablative, meaning that they've removed the what's differentiated already as an immune system, but they leave the bone marrow alone. Those programs can produce a good response, but only for a few years. Okay. And, and, and our work in Canada has shown that if you remove not only the peripheral immune system, but you remove the bone marrow as well, you get a long-term remission. And in our case, we've seen now more than 20 years of quiescence, nobody getting another relapse, nobody developing even a single new uh, MRI lesion and nobody requiring any further disease modifying medication. And that's not the story with the immunoablative transplants where up to a quarter of patients start having new activity again and probably require DMT. So that's a whole different process wherein we're removing the old, replacing it with a new that no longer attacks. From the same area, the support cells, the stroma, mm -hmm. give rise to the mesenchymal stem cells. Now there are a lot of places that are offering MSCs, but, you know, if you go in the morning and, and, and they take your blood and in the afternoon, they said they're giving you back your MSCs, which a lot of these fly-by-night sites are doing, they're not giving you anything. The number of MSCs you're getting from, from a blood draw are, are minuscule. Or people are taking fat out in the morning and giving you MSCs in the afternoon. For the study I did with Antonio Uccelli, which, by the way, was no small undertaking, yeah. not different countries, 22 different centers, all funded by the MS societies of their respective nations, ran a protocol using very similar recipe to make the MSCs from the patient's own bone marrow and giving it back to them. But before we could do that, we had to grow them in a center that can grow cells. It takes two to three weeks to generate the one to two million per kilo dosing that we're using in these trials. You can't just do that in the morning and give the cells back in the right. afternoon. So there's lots of centers that are just simply selling it to patients, but I'm not sure what they're selling. Well, that's important to say because I think some of the excitement that happens with stem cells, people sometimes look on the internet and they say, well, this place says they can give it to me. Why not just go there? And the answer is that they're probably not giving you very many stem cells, if any at all. If any at all, and, and how are they giving it? Uh, this has been the debate with the uh, recent study that you interviewed Dr. Cohen about where uh, they were giving it intrathecally. Uh, the same uh, 
technique of giving it both intravenous and intrathecal was used by the Israelis mm -hmm. in their recent publication of the uh, MSCs, but it was a single center. But mm -hmm. they all claimed that the intrathecal made a difference. This is making sense, Daniel, but I mean, I don't know how many patients are going to need to get lumbar puncture twice a year for I don't know how many years to get the cells? It's, I guess, you know, if you, if it made a huge difference and repaired, uh, people would do it, but uh, it, but it's a difficult sell because I, I haven't been convinced that it's been able to turn the people's disease around. Well, when you're when you're giving the cells, how do the cells know to go to the brain and areas of damage and not just go anywhere else? I mean, you're giving them, let's just say you're giving it into the vein, right? So you're giving it intravenously. But let's say the person has heart disease or a little bit of kidney disease or you know their joints aren't doing so well. Why are those cells going to go to the brain and not go to other places? It's a great question. And the signals that draw the, the MSCs to damaged tissue haven't yet been worked out. Mm -hmm. But even at our center, uh, long before we started the study in MS, um, Duncan Stewart, who heads our institute, actually uh, got funding to do it in, in heart attack patients. Mm -hmm. And in those cases, the MSCs migrate to the damaged heart tissue and mm -hmm. looks like they, they uh, um, either convince local cells to repair or somehow they're involved in themselves uh, repairing damaged heart tissue. So it's something about the MSCs and maybe that's why they exist in our body mm -hmm. is that they can be called upon to enhance repair wherever it might be. There must be some universal signal uh, that is a call out to these cells. Especially mm -hmm. if you think about it, you're giving them intravenously. Mm -hmm. The first place they go is the lung. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people think that the lung is just like your gut and your skin, an immune organ. Mm -hmm. And it is. We owe that all too well from COVID, don't we? Yeah. So the lung is a real ripe area that can uh, stimulate our immune system there may be certain factors that act on these cells as they transition the lung that somehow redirects them into where they need to go. Because they we've seen that they actually migrate to these tissues. If you do the, look at the animal studies where they tag the cells, they end up where they have to go. Right. Uh, and, and in the case of uh, MS, so the model that was used was EAE, and they went right into the brain, mm -hmm. and you can see them there next to the oligodendrocytes uh, where they needed to be. What are your next plans for the international collaboration that, that you've been co-directing? Well, obviously to work on a stem cell trial uh, with independent centers like we were doing uh, is just way too tedious and, and not feasible if we were to say prove that it worked you're going to need the industry to help you out here. Uh, we were able to grow cells for no more than, say, two people at a time in, in our stem cell facility. And, and that when you have thousands of people mm -hmm. clamoring for a therapy, that's not going to work. And, right. and need a, a, some one of our, uh, our industry sponsors or, or industry members who are, are just working now to develop themselves into stem cell facilities where you can mass produce uh, a stem cell product. And, and I think that's the next level. So sort of what was happening with the, the study that Jeff was involved in, mm -hmm. they're the company that's producing those cells. We need to uh, move forward with something similar like that. Our study involved nine countries in 22 different centers and you could argue 22 different preparations you need some uniform preparation given to a number of people. And the only way you're going to do that is to partner with industry. Okay. Well, Dr. Friedman, thank you so much for joining us yet again. And everyone back home, thank you for watching Real-Time Neurology. Thanks, Daniel.